Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Verisk Emerging Issues team. My name is Andy Blancher, and I lead our Emerging Issues team here at Verisk. Today, we've got a riveting presentation in store concerning really how we perceive and manage risk. But before we go any further, I would like to begin with our policy statement. The policy of Verisk Analytics and subsidiary companies is to comply in all respects with federal and state antitrust laws. With this in mind, we want to mention that during all seminars held under our auspices, this policy prohibits discussion on certain topics. Because we want to avoid even the appearance of an antitrust violation, we go beyond the letter of the law and will not, be, will not discuss any matter that violates the spirit of the antitrust laws or could be perceived as doing so. A copy of our policy statement on discussion at meetings can be found at veris.com slash statement. Uh, we are happy to have with us on the call Veris attorney Jason Kurtz. He's just going to help keep us on track. Um, I think if we just adhere to the antitrust guidance, we should be good and Jason doesn't have to jump in and we'll be off to the races. A couple of quick notes before we just jump right in here. Um, we want to hear from you. Use the chat function in the GoToWebinar. Share your reactions, anything that comes to mind. Only he, you know, only we here at Veris can see what you put into the chat. And sometimes we get more questions than we can answer in time, but uh, we will work to answer your questions afterwards if we can't get to all of them. And one final note, our guest speaker has kindly agreed to run this presentation from the other side of the globe, actually. He's in a different hemisphere, in fact, uh, coming to us from Australia. So just please understand that there could be a few minor lags in the advancement of slides or maybe the audio is not matching up for a moment, but we should be able to make our way through that if you could just uh, hang with us there. Without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce Raid Musselin. Raid is a principal at Finity Consulting. Uh, he just told us he got up at 3.45 a.m. So, Raid, thank you so much for doing that for us. And uh, with that, I, I, I hope we didn't wake up your dreams of gray swans and black elephants when that alarm went off, but we, we're thrilled to hear what you have to say. Raid, take it away. All right, thank you. And Andy, just to verify, you can hear me? Coming through loud and clear. Fantastic. Well, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I guess um, we're going to be talking about extreme risk and um, and extreme events today. So you can rest assured that tomorrow will happen since it's now Friday, the 22nd, where I am. So that, you know, the, the, the tomorrow will occur so we can get past that worry uh, for the rest of the day. Well, thank you. And um, in this presentation, I'm going to try to introduce to you a number of ideas about extreme risk which uh and and uh, even though I, I am an actuary i will uh, confess to that um i i have deliberately kept numbers and graphs out of this uh presentation because it's meant to be a conceptual discussion that will throw a lot of different ideas at you and um hopefully a few of these ideas will uh trigger you to think about risk in a different way than perhaps you had before. And I'm going to use a lot of authors and historical events to illustrate some issues in risk management and risk perception. So our agenda is it's in four sections this presentation. The first talks about uh, catastrophic complexity and I illustrate it with a series of creatures, swans, elephants, and butterflies. Then I want to talk about some big mistakes in history that were examples of what we call catastrophic complexity. I'll then talk about some gray swans to illustrate how uh, when traumatic events affect our society, we often uh, recover with better resilience and better systems. And then we'll, we'll close with just a couple of quick comments on how we can maybe do a better job in risk management to avoid these problems. So the first section, I'm gonna talk about several authors. And um, the first uh, is a quote from uh, Talib to talk about what a black swan is. And the second is uh, when I was in university, I studied Chinese history and actually worked in China for, for many years uh, when I was working in Asia. And uh, actually you had to read the selected works of Mao Zedong. That's one of my uh, textbooks from university there. That's why it's so bashed up. 
But he had a quote I always like, which is, uh, everything under heaven in, is in utter chaos. The situation is excellent. And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about chaotic situations in the next uh, few minutes. So the, the, don't expect to read this. This is just a picture of, a, of an article I'm gonna talk about. But the first um, author I'll talk about is a guy named David Brooks. If any of you watch NPR, he's Brooks and Capehart, used to be Brooks and Shields. He wrote a really good book, which I really enjoyed uh, talking about how you know humans are social animals and about um, our uh, the way we perceive things. And he wrote an article after the Deepwater Horizon debacle called Drilling for Certainty, where he talked about um, this event is an example of the bloody crossroads where complex technical systems meet human psychology. And he, he listed six attributes of human thinking which often lead to disasters. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna read all these slides, but this particular list I wanna read through because I, I think it's worth emphasizing a few points. You know, how often have we let small things lead to enormous disasters? In this case, they had a blowout preventer that failed down under the ocean and the entire Gulf of Mexico was polluted. We allow ourselves to get acclimated to risk. Um, you know, how often do we worry about blood clots from a COVID-19 vaccine when indeed we cross the street every day with a hundred times higher risk of, of injury or death. We play, place too much faith in backup devices. We match complicated systems with complicated governance. We have a good news bias in our thinking and we are overcome by groupthink, which is just reinforced by things like social media. And Brooks concluded his article by saying that, you know, we've got a world now where the potential for catastrophe is embedded everywhere. And he referred to that as catastrophic complexity. And I just always like that term because it so well describes our situation these days. The next two authors I, I wanted to cite are Talib, who wrote the Black Swan book, and, and a guy named um, Greg uh, Traverton, who wrote, who was uh, on the National Intelligence Council, and he wrote the book *Truth to Power*, another great book if you're interested. He, it was about the intelligence community having to tell politicians things they didn't want to hear, and they wrote an article about the Arab Spring uprisings in places like Egypt called *The Calm Before the Storm*. And in *The Calm Before the Storm*, they made several interesting points. And they talked about why volatility signals stability and vice versa. So they, they basically were saying that volatile systems sometimes are stable. Think of the Italians who've had like 50 governments since World War II. And sometimes stable systems, think Egypt pre the Arab Spring, are actually quite uh, unstable, even though they appear to be so. The past experience is not a good indicator of tail risk. And instead of thinking about what could happen, it's sometimes more useful to think about whether the system could handle disorder and unplanned events. And generally systems which experience periodic change and disorder become resilient. And ones that suppress that become fragile. And the question is, do efforts to create stability sow the seeds for black swans? For example, a black swan could have been the fact that there was a heat wave over the Ukraine and Russia, which then led to massive crop failures of wheat crops uh, all around the world, including there and in places like Australia and China, which led to a huge increase in the price of wheat. That then led the price of a loaf of bread in many countries to go from a dollar a day to three dollars a day when the average wage was two dollars a day. And predictably, it we saw political chaos and fragile systems having problems. My next animal is the elephant. And uh, a guy named Adam Sweden um, is the first person I saw quote this term, but he, he described a black elephant as a cross between a black swan and the elephant in the room. And it's basically that nobody wants to talk about, but something we know is inevitably gonna happen. And he said there's herds of black elephants around listing things like global warming, pollution, ocean acidification. And I'd ask you, you know, wasn't COVID-19 an example of a black elephant? 
If you um, go look up this event 201 and Google it, that was at Johns Hopkins University, which was actually my alumnus. I'm an alumni of Johns Hopkins. Uh, they did a, a simulation of a pandemic that started in China uh, right before the pandemic, and they basically nailed COVID-19, and nobody paid any attention. My last creature in this section is butterflies. And it's important to understand and risk the butterfly effect, which basically um, is, is, is that small random events can have enormous consequences in chaotic systems. And back to my mouth quote, you know, chaos theory teaches us a lot. And, and one of the key insights is that when you have very complex systems, small changes in starting conditions can lead to very vastly different outcomes. And I'll cite a few examples, Gore versus Bush. I happen to be working in Florida and Tallahassee during the Gore v. Bush election. And, um, and you just think that for the difference of 500 votes in Florida, Al Gore could have been president instead of George Bush and how things might have changed. Or Archduke Ferdinand, whose driver made a wrong turn in Sarajevo in 1914 and the assassination that ensued led to World War I. Or Lieutenant Colonel Petrov, who was a Russian duty officer in the nuclear uh, watch center in, in the Soviet Union, who saw US incoming missiles on his radar in 1983 and chose not to call his superiors and tell them that they were under nuclear attack, which might have had avoided an accidental nuclear war. So now I wanna talk about a couple of examples of catastrophic complexity. And this was a quote I, I really liked from a guy named Thomas Friedman that, you know, America's political system was designed by geniuses so it could be run by idiots. But then he said, no, I was wrong. No system can be smart enough to survive the level of incompetence and recklessness by the people charged to run it. For the record, he wrote that in 2008. So it was in no way related to any contemporary political actors. So my first um, example is the Carrington event. And I entitle my first three slides, it happened before technology. And what I mean by that is one way you can think about black swans is if we take things that actually happened in the past and ask ourselves what would happen if the same thing that really happened in the past happened today. And we talk a lot about 200 year events. Well, let's go back within the last 200 years and consider that in 1859, a solar storm occurred, which uh, basically the, at the time, the most interesting thing was the telegraph papers were catching fire because of all the electricity flowing through the uh, overloaded uh, telegraph lines. If that happened today, it would knock out satellite communications, electric grids, and fry half the transformers in the world. And due to how long it takes to make transformers, we could be without electricity in many developed countries for years. And the losses, according to US government uh, calculations, would be in the trillions. And this is something that really happened. And actually, it almost happened again in 1987, when many of you might remember the Quebec blackouts, which was caused by the same problem. A second example I'll cite was the European air crisis uh, maybe 15 years ago, where we had a case where we had a volcano erupt in Iceland. Now, volcanoes have been erupting frequently in Iceland for millennia. And in fact, ever since Europeans bumped into Iceland, there have been volcanoes going off up there. And there's many, many historical examples of the continent of Europe being covered with dust clouds of volcanic ash. Well, it just so happens that none of those had occurred during the jet airplane era. And everybody was shocked and nobody in the airline industry had really done any risk planning for what they would do if volcanic ash covered Europe, which it had time and time again over the last prior thousand years. And they were surprised when the air traffic system was shut down for months. And then Tohoku, which actually happened on my wife's birthday, uh, and I was working in Asia Pacific at the time, and Japan was part of my territory. And 
you know, if you go into Japan and you look um, in the uh, in the woods, and I've, I've actually seen a couple of these things around the country, though not at Tohoku, they've actually got these things called tsunami stones. There's a picture of it in the lower right corner there, which is the place the tsunami came to in the past. And they've had tsunamis in Japan routinely in Eastern Japan, again, for millennia. And that stone basically says on it, do not build anything between here and the coast. Well, guess what they did? They put a nuclear power plant on the coast with a six foot seawall and didn't back waterproof the backup generators. Now, you know, how on earth could you make a mistake like that? And uh, interestingly enough, there was another nuclear power plant uh, run by the same company about 30 kilometers up the coast, which suffered no problems because they actually had waterproofed the backup generator room. But it just goes to show you that uh, people continuously ignore historical events when they're doing modern construction. Uh, Thailand floods, another one that I was personally involved with. Um, when I was working over there, uh, they had massive floods in Thailand, I believe in 2010. And we we basically had a, a situation where huge numbers of uh, automobile and other manufacturing facilities went underwater and were knocked out of the global supply chain. And you had auto workers in Europe and Tennessee being uh, you know, furloughed because they didn't have parts from these factories in Thailand. And I remember talking to one company that lost an enormous amount of money insuring one of those factories. And they said, this was not on our risk radar. And I said, well, how's that possible? I mean, it's on a river in Thailand, mate. I mean, come on. And he said, well, our models didn't include Thailand, meaning their catastrophe models, because at the time there weren't any good flood models for Thailand. So people were insuring $3 billion factories on a river in Thailand in an unmodeled area. And that teaches us that just because risk is not modeled does not mean that it does not exist. And I'm sure I violated some English principles with too many knots in that statement. Um, coming to my current country, Australia, it's a good example of how managing one risk creates another. In the 1970s here, we had a massive flood in Brisbane. So we built these dams in, uh, in Queensland to prevent another flood. And then of course, once we built the dams, we figured we controlled the flood risk and we then built hundreds of thousands of homes in the flood in the floodplain below the dams because of course we now controlled the risk well we had a prolonged drought then we had a la nina so during the drought they filled the dam up because they didn't want to run out of water so they took a risk control mechanism designed to control flooding and they repurposed it to control drought and then, of course, predictably, when the La Nina occurred, there were several large cyclones, huge amounts of rain, like a Hurricane Harvey situation in Houston. The dam overflowed. Billions and billions of dollars of losses occurred where the models said they never should have happened. The thousand year event became the 30 year event. And this illustrates the human factor and risk. You know, how do you model the behavior of the dam operators who just, you know, completely missed it on this one and ended up uh, uh, keeping a large army of lawyers quite happy for many years filing lawsuits? Hurricane Pam. Again, I've, I've worked in a number of places, including Florida, as I mentioned, and we were subject to cyclones or hurricanes as y'all call them and uh, we had hurricane pam exercise where in we simulated a hurricane coming across uh, uh, eastern louisiana western mississippi and making landfall and in this simulation there were 500,000 buildings destroyed a million people evacuated levees failed enormous problems in new orleans that was done in 2004. Guess what happened in 2005? 
Hurricane Katrina did exactly what the simulation said. Then there was the infamous Crimson Contagion uh, exercise done by the Department of Health and Human Services in October 2019, which simulated the effect of a pandemic. I think in that case, it started in Brazil, but it basically called COVID-19 down to the every almost every effect. It's almost scary to read that report. And in fact, they tried to suppress it. And I think some newspaper got a hold of it and put it on the internet. Um, but uh, it, it basically laid out COVID-19. Again, did they do anything about it? No. And I'll just leave you with my brother's a lawyer and, he, and we have a lawyer on the call and he had this term they used in law school, the thing speaks for itself. I talked earlier about becoming acclimated to risk. Well, think about the Beirut blast. They impounded a ship who didn't pay its port fees full of ammonium nitrate. And then they stuck it in a warehouse and left it there for years while they argued about what to do about it. Everybody knew it was sitting there in the middle of Beirut. And guess what? They got acclimated to the risk. Then guess what? It blew up and leveled most of the city and took out a large chunk of the country's food supply. So, you know, what do you learn from this section? And I guess, you know, these events and many others illustrate some things you should think about risk management. You know, our world has become complex, interdependent, and it's very difficult to extrapolate what could happen from past events. You know, we're great as actuaries at taking the last 20 years of data, torturing it to death, simulating it 10,000 times, and then thinking we understand the tail risk. But in fact, if you just look back in recent history and ask yourself a simple question, what would happen if that happened again today, you would have seen Tohoku, you would have seen the uh, air disaster in Europe. You would have seen several things. You could have taken the 1918 pandemic and played it forward just as they did and seen what we're living through in COVID. So I think, you know, so, the lesson for me as an actuary a modeler is that, you know, we often become too comfortable with our modeling and ignore risk that falls outside our models. And we forget about the human factor, like those people running the dams in Queensland who let them fill up and then they weren't fit for purpose when the rains came. But, you know, to give you some hope, as we'll see in the next section, we do seem to have a remarkable capacity to adjust to this risk. So I wanna give you some examples of how we've fixed it. So I always like this Confucius quote too from my Chinese history classes, study the past if you would define the future. So let's look at some past debacles. Um, the gold standard, when President Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1971, prior to that, exchange rates were fixed. So uh, basically, a, a British airline, Laker Airways, paid for planes in US dollars and bought jet fuel in US dollars, but sold tickets in UK pounds and never thought twice about what would happen if the exchange rates changed. And they're just one of a, a huge number of companies that got caught out when the exchange rates suddenly adjusted and were either forced into bankruptcy or serious problems. And we developed out of that new tools, which we think of as just commonplace today, foreign exchange hedging, ERM, currency options, derivative markets. The 1970s oil crises. I remember when petrol was 25 cents a gallon and I had a Pontiac Bonneville got about six miles a gallon. And that was unfortunate when we had a oil embargo in the 1970s and created a massive shock to the system. And it eventually led to a large bout of inflation. And this was where many firms had, you know, like savings and loans or insurance companies had mismatched assets and liabilities. You know, their assets, uh, you know, uh, may have been uh, long-term bonds and their liabilities were short-tailed uh, claims. 
And so out of that, we developed a lot of cool toys too, which we think of, uh, again, just as normal today, like uh, you know, monetary policy, using interest rates to adjust for um, uh, inflation, uh, asset liability matching, further developments in ERM. And I'd ask you today, you know, if the lessons of this era have been forgotten, how many people younger than I am remember inflation? And um, I think we may be uh, dusting off the history books in the next few years to sort of remember what inflation looks like, because I think we may have kind of gotten a little too, um, you know, too complacent about that problem in recent years. Hurricane Andrew, um, again, as I said, I used to work in Florida, remembered this one. Um, we had Hurricane Andrew hit Florida. Now we know darn well that hurricanes hit Florida all the time, and there's been massive you know, events in the past, 1926 Great Miami Hurricane. Andrew came in and did something we should have easily foreseen. Uh, destroyed, you know, thousands of, tens of thousands of homes, 11 insurers went broke, a uh, million policyholders almost lost coverage, complete disaster. And it demonstrated some serious risk control failures. Uh, since I am in a Verisk seminar, I will note that it was the ISO excess wind procedure that had been mandated by our friends in the Florida uh, Office of Insurance Regulation as the rate making procedure in those days. And that basically made you look at the last 30 years to predict the next five years. And of course, since we hadn't had hurricanes for 30 years due to a cyclical low, the prices were grossly inadequate and the loss thoroughly surprised us. So that led to a poor understanding of loss potential. And then the cheap insurance also led to overdevelopment, poor building practices, and set the stage for a massive disaster. But as with the other cases that I illustrated, we proved our resilience. The government put in new regulatory structures, uh, formed the Florida Modeling Commission to allow catastrophe models to be used, uh, formed the Florida Hurricane Catastrophe Fund, Citizens Insurance, strengthened the Garrity Fund. Uh, we got in good building codes that uh, were proved their worth in 2004 when we had four hurricanes and then we got hit with Wilma and Katrina again in 2005 and the market proved its resilience and was relatively uh, unscathed relative to the 1990s. So again, risk management advances led to improvements and losses. So that's again, a good lesson. Once again, a big event happens, you learn from it, you do something to um, mitigate the risk. The World Trade Center, 9-11. Um, we all remember that terrible day. And again, we were, we were highly surprised that terrorists would graduate from, um, you know, small bombings to mass bombings. But again, that should not have been a complete surprise to us if we had really been aware of the risk. And, you know, I remember the days when you could uh, walk through uh, to an airplane off the street with no security and go back and sit in row 43 and light up a cigarette on the plane. Um, so, you know, how times change. Um, but we had a government response to 9-11, which included the war on terror. We instituted security screenings, hardened infrastructure, invested in security, all those big planners that are out in front of buildings now so you can't drive a truck bomb into the building. We created insurance risk pools like uh, TRIA, Pool Re in the UK, ARPC here. And we improved risk management significantly through terrorism models, policy wordings, new pricing techniques. And there's actually now a you know, pretty robust terrorism reinsurance market in, uh, globally because we managed the risk, we controlled it, and uh, the re market recovered. The global financial crisis of 2007, 2008, where we allowed exotic financial instruments called CDOs to uh, be let loose like a virus on the financial system, 
which triggered a lot of issues like a housing bubble, et cetera. But once again, after the event, we learned from it and put in uh, you know, new financial regulation, uh, the Basel III uh, protocols you know, that came out of Europe, contingent capital, higher quality uh, capital uh, buffers, larger buffers, and, and basically much more monitoring. And that's probably served us well over the past uh, decade in terms of um, managing the risk. But you, know, you wonder if similar issues are lurking today, you know, Google the, the term CLO, that's uh, collateralized loan obligations, and you might see some you know, parallels to what we saw with CDOs. So, you know, what, what do I take from all this stuff? Um, you know, there's many other examples of events like this. And, you know, most or all of these examples contain elements of my creatures from the first section, black swans, black elephants, butterflies, and, and other and, uh, analogous things. And they also illustrate concepts of fragility and catastrophic complexity. So if you sort of think about the first section of my talk, and I sort of laid the groundwork with some kind of parts of human psychology that play into this stuff. Um, and then you think about some things that have happened, you sort of see the same themes coming through a lot of these black swan, in quotes, events. And the next takeaway is that, you know, in each case, the situation looked appalling at the moment. I remember after 9-11, I didn't think I'd ever see a terrorism market again. And yet, new institutions and tools emerge to manage the risk. And I think there's lessons in this for the current pandemic. That, you know, risk you need to understand from both models and mindset. And complex systems are rife with interconnected risks. Um, gee whiz. Didn't we learn anything in the Thailand floods about supply chains? And look at the supply chain problems we're having right now. They were completely predictable if you had a significant pandemic. And again, many companies failed to strengthen their supply chains and learn from that and you know several other. The Tohoku earthquake caused a bunch of supply chain issues out of Japan. And yet we still seem to not learn the lesson of how vulnerable we are to those things. And I think human psychology is a key factor in that. And that's something that's tough to model, as we saw with our friends in the dam operators in Queensland. But you can transform seemingly intractable problems through risk mitigation. And I guess the last point is, as we saw with the Thailand floods and other things, that you know many risks are global. And I would suggest going into COP26 that neither viruses nor carbon respect borders. And so some things require global solutions. And what's in the national interest narrowly may not be in the long-term interest of either the country or the society. And as a final thought, you know, calamities can be avoided. You know, there are many examples like Y2K, which everybody thought was gonna freeze computers up and we didn't get it. And, you know, as a benefit of Y2K, we got a lot of IT, innovation, which uh, is partly responsible, I think, for some of the, you know, boom in the internet and um, everything we're seeing these days with online uh, services. There's the Montreal Protocol, which uh, banned uh, CFCs and uh, was a case where the globe came together when the ozone layer was uh, being depleted. And uh, we basically would have had no ozone layer and massive problems from uh, crop failures and radiation and all kinds of problems by about 2060 had they not banned certain types of refrigerants. Well, they did, and now the ozone layer is going to be back to almost pre-industrial levels by 2060. And there's a few other ones I, I listed there, including the hur Florida hurricanes. Oh, and by the way, there's an error on my slide. The four hur Florida hurricanes were in 2004. We had two other ones in 2005. My, my apologies for that typo. I should know better, I went through them. And, uh, and now we're looking for near Earth objects um, to hopefully avoid being surprised by an asteroid. So my final section uh, for the last few minutes, I wanna talk about evolving the risk management paradigm. And uh, this is the infamous Donald Rumsfeld Rumsfeld quote, which I won't um, 
read, but you can read for yourselves. But you know, it's the unknown unknowns. That's the ones that really cause problems. And a lot of the uh, issues I cited in the prior sections, I might have, I might have a fourth category. You know, we had the known knowns, the known unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. There may be or some other ones that <clears throat> were the unknown but should have been known. And I think those are the ones I've been talking about. Most all those crises I listed that we were surprised by, we should have known better. So um, I'm gonna, there's a really good article I wanna refer you to um, by McKinsey that talks about problem solving mindsets. And they did a, they did a very interesting little, little uh, thought exercise and they gathered some research on problem solving mindsets. And uh, I apologize for putting my glasses on here, but I have to refer to my notes because I can't read them without my glasses. But they, they titled six things that really help you tackle problems like this. The first one was to, you know, kind of be ever curious, you know, don't, you know, don't get lazy and, and always be asking the question of why, what, and how, and how can things go wrong? The second was tolerate ambiguity and stay humble. You know, the real world is really uncertain. And research shows that we're better at solving problems when we think in terms of odds rather than certainties. So for example, don't ask what you think's going to happen. Think about a range of things which could happen. And about stay humble, uh, when people come to work for me, um, I tell them that my, th my three favorite words they can utter are I was wrong you know, because we're all wrong sometimes. And you have to remember that. Uh, take a do dragon's eye view, which basically dragonfly, dragonfly, sorry, dragonfly eyes. Uh, dragonflies have massive compound eyes that can simultaneously see 360 degrees around them and can see multiple things at once. And that means, you know, look around, you know, take a, take a you know, take a wide view of things. The fourth was pursue a current behavior, which means look at what's actually happening, not what you predicted to happen. Number five, tack into collective intelligence and the wisdom of the crowd. You know, crowdsourcing can be a powerful tool to understand what's going on. And as perhaps I tried to do today, uh, you know, do show and tell, use examples, use pictures, try to, try to lead people to think better by showing them, telling them stories. My final two authors I'll cite today, and again, another tremendous article, If you, it's very short if you ever have time to read it, called A Better Crystal Ball by uh, uh, Skroblik and uh, Tetlock. Uh, these, these guys wrote this article and they're foreign policy wonks. Um, and they basically wrote, you know, based on their experience of trying to get, do games of, you know, war games and things, you know, kind of what are we missing about crises looking at COVID? And, you know, they basically made the comment that the U.S. is getting the, you know, worst of both worlds, huge amounts of money preparing for things that, uh, you know, maybe fighting World War II over again. And yet we still miss obvious risks where we don't spend enough money, such as COVID-19, or I might suggest uh, New Orleans levies prior to Katrina. And simply because I couldn't resist the quote, I have to uh, note that Tetlock's study in 2005 compared expert predictions with random uh, guesses. And he said that, you know, a lot of times experts had trouble outperforming dart tossing chimpanzees when it came to predicting global events. No insult intended to chimpanzees here, but um, I, I just, I like that term and I, I often use it with my staff of actuaries when they get it wrong. He talked about hedgehogs versus foxes, which are, you know, you know, the, basically people who are always sure they're right are often the worst predictors. And it's usually the ones who hedge their bets and who are unsure that often fare much better. And this is a really important one, the next bullet, which is, you know, instead of asking experts about long-term scenarios, you know, break problems down into, you know, scores of simple questions 
and create signposts along the way to your forecast. And they call this the, the process of question clusters. So let me give you an example. If we say we're gonna hit net zero by 2050 using the you know, current COP26 as just a random example, we should not have a scenario that says we're gonna to get to 2050 net zero, we're gonna do this, that, and the other in 2050. We should instead be saying, well, if we do that by 2025, we're going to pass a law that says we're gonna phase out uh, internal combustion engines by 2035. By 2029, we're gonna to begin to put uh, charging stations all over the interstate highway system. By 2031, we're going to have improved battery technology and so on and so forth. And you break the problem down into 50 or 60 sub questions with dates attached and then you can tell each year whether your long-term forecast is on track or not and if it's not you need to do another scenario and update your scenarios and and the other lesson they said is draw upon groups of experts instead of individuals you know often in my company sometimes we'll even create an a and a b team you know to try to solve a problem and argue with each other um, and then the last one is, you know, blend scenario analysis and prob probabilistic forecasts. Um, you know, that those they're not necessarily incompatible. And if, if you think about uh, that dam operator example in Queensland, if you'd use the, the flood modeling that said you couldn't have a loss in an area and you then combine that with a scenario where the dam operator stuffed up, you might have actually figured that problem out by applying the flood models thousand year event to the 30 year event that actually happened to understand the risk better. So my final slide, uh, and then I'll close, and if any of you have questions, I'll do my best to answer them. It's sort of a summary of all this stuff. And I'll, I'll go through each of these points kind of one by one um, that, you know, we can't possibly really anticipate what may happen decades in the future. So instead, maybe we need to focus on learning about failures and then designing our systems for resilience and adaptability. Um, I, I do some climate change work these days, and uh, I always tell folks that you know you need to basically plan for policy reversals like that could occur when there's elections and you need to be adaptable to multiple possible future states and in building resilience there's two keys to that first of all you not have to be able to deal with the possibility where you can hold conflicting ideas in your mind and be open to new ideas and to try to think, okay, well, maybe there's two or three different plausible futures, and I can't let my, you know, biases, you know, say that only that one future is possible. And as I said earlier, you got to be adaptable. Do not fear the words "I was wrong" or "I've changed my mind." Good forecasters utter those words frequently. Study history. You know, think about how new technology is affecting stuff that's happened time and time again in the past. Think stochastically. You know, there is not one certain future, there are multiple futures. And you need to think about them in that way. For Mr. Brooks, we remember that we need to develop new skills to deal with catastrophic complexity in human psychology. From Taleb and Traverton, understand why volatility can actually signal stability and vice versa. For McKinsey, adopt that six-step problem-solving mindset. And from Skoblik and Tetlock, use clusters of sharply defined questions and break down your scenarios into small, bite-sized, clear questions instead of grand, simplistic future states. With that, uh, I will close and turn it back to Andy to ask any questions. Uh, that's me. Uh, there's are my contact details there. If you want to get a hold of me, I'm happy to, um, you know, uh, talk with you or answer questions. And it's been an honor uh, speaking with you today. I think there is, oops, that's probably too early. I shouldn't have put that on yet. So I'll leave it there. Um, and Andy, I'll turn it back to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ray. Great stuff there. I I, uh, I did see a, a question come in, and it kind of made me think about 
what you talked about David Brooks and imploring us to develop new skills. And I was wondering if you had thoughts in terms of maybe not just new skills, but new technologies like artificial intelligence and how we might be able to leverage those in grappling with this this world of changing risk. Oh, that, that's a that's a that's a great question, and um, and really, our artificial intelligence and and actually, I've been privileged in the firm I work with now. We've actually got some artificial intelligence experts that build these like neural nets to to try to process data, and and that can be a, a fantastic tool to um, help us better understand the complexity around us. I mean, the biggest problem I think we've, we've got with some of this stuff is that the systems that we are trying to manage risk in have become so complex that it's really hard for any one person or even group of people to really understand all the complexities in that. And certainly big data and machine learning can be powerful tools to uh, help us understand that. But once again, we've got to be careful and no, I'm not a, you know, I, although I, I love movies like, you know, 2001 and the Schwarzenegger Skynet Terminator series, I'm not worried about the, you know, robots taking over the world, but I, I do worry about us becoming over-reliant on things like AI and machine learning with big data to the point at which we just miss the obvious because we we don't initialize our models correctly and we don't actually, you know, we kind of over rely on those models and don't blend those models with sense checks, common sense and an understanding of history. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we do have another question uh, that I wanted to just toss your way. This is kind of broad, just giving a heads up. Um, how should underwriting risk management teams approach resilience resiliency in developing risk management practices going forward? That's again, a, a really good question also. Um, and look, I think underwriters and risk managers, you know, really need to take a step back and try to think about, you know, not, not only do what do we think is gonna happen, but what could happen. And, and then again, taking a page out of some of the, um, the, the last part of my presentation where, you know, they talk about the value of crowdsourcing and experts. You know, I've, I often, one of the things in my company now, we have 200 employees in our firm and, you know, we've got this uh, Slack chat channel and we'll, we'll just throw a question out to the 200 people, including the, you know, new grads when we're working on a problem and just sort of see what answers we get back. You know, what do you think could happen with this? Or what do you think? And you'd be amazed at how many times, uh, you know, somebody who, you know, graduated from uni six months ago comes up with the right answer when the, you know, older guys in the firm like me missed it. And so I think, you know, you know, getting, you know, socializing problems to larger groups of people when you try to ask what if and what could go wrong is important. And I, I think the other, the other really big thing to do is is to try to understand um, the range of uncertainty around things like uh, again I do some work in climate consulting and people come out with these forecasts that in 2050 you know we're going to have 12 percent more hurricanes um, or you know if there's a uh, or some other thing like a terrorist attack it's going to cause you know 38.7 billion dollars worth of damage in Seattle or some other ridiculous thing you know, you got to understand that there's a range of uncertainty around a lot of this stuff and that, you know, you, you don't only need to ask about, you know, what do we think the estimate of the risk is, but what's the range around that estimate? And that's a question we often fail to ask. And I think for underwriters and risk managers, you know, if your actuaries uh, come in and again, I'm, I'm one of them, so, you know, you can blame me. Uh, but if they come in and tell you that, you know, the answer is 13, you know, then say, well, 13 plus or minus what? You know, because um, often we get a false sense of precision uh, from answers that look precise, but are actually quite mushy. And understanding the, you know, sort of relative confidence or lack of confidence in the risks, risk assessments you do is almost as valuable as looking at the risks themselves. And I don't know if that answered your question, but it was my best attempt. Sounded good to me. 
this this next well actually I got well I've got a few things. Um, no, let me start here. Uh, and this might be um, a little a little specific, so feel free to generalize. But uh, how do you prevent the series of decisions that brought about the Deepwater Horizon event? Yeah, well, that 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 event has been dissected a lot, and I, I'll confess I'm not an expert in it, but I'll I'll I'll, I'll take a, my best shot at it. If, if if you think about the cascade of failures that occurred there, um, probably the biggest one was that they had there at, there's actually a, a transcript of a risk management meeting they found uh, from I think I think it was BP I can't remember who managed that thing. And and basically they said, well, we don't have to worry about any risk planning on what happens if there's a blowout at this well, because we've got this new fancy blowout protector down there a mile under the water that will stop it from happening. So let's not worry about it. And in some cases, then they had a group think where all the engineers in the room said, yeah, that's right. We just designed that thing. So that can't happen. So they kind of failed to actually figure out what they would do if the thing didn't work because they put too much reliance on the thing that was the one point of failure in the system that they failed to understand that the entire risk management plan was based on that one piece of equipment and that if it failed we'd have the gulf of mexico full of oil and they they basically got overconfident suffered from groupthink and and then basically you know failed to ask well what if that you know where's the point of failure you know where's the key component in this chain of you know risk and again if you look at the thailand flood thing we, you know we had the same problem you know there, there was a you know all of the production for this there was a guy told me the he's from switzerland i know and he and he said you know this german auto plant had to shut down because the paint that they used in these uh Audis or whatever they were making, the only place the pigment came from was Thailand in this factory. So when that pigment was not available, they couldn't make their cars. The whole bloody car because of, of a paint that they couldn't get their hands on out of this auto factory. And again, it's another example like Deepwater Horizon where you know you had a whole chain of risk managers all over that thing and there was one point where if that failed, the whole thing fell over. And they failed to really identify what that point was and manage it. And so I think you can draw lessons from these these things about, you know, you, you need to be able to, you know, identify where is that key point of failure in your system and try to manage it. Yeah, it sounds like in those examples there weren't any any real redundancies or backup plans. Well, no, there actually there were for about 83 of the risks in the risk register. It's just the 84th one they didn't have a backup plan for. <laughs> and that's that's the problem. And, and that might quickly be, be another thing that they pointed out was that sometimes we have our governance systems that are too complicated for the system. So we go out and put a risk register together with 5,000 things in it. And we fail to ask ourselves, what are the three or four key things that if they went wrong, all the other stuff doesn't matter? And so they probably had massive numbers of risks that they micromanaged, but they missed, you know, the one point where if that failed, the whole thing went to, you know what? Right, right. All right. So I know we're coming up on on, on the hour, but I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a tidbit that we got from the audience. It's not a question, right? Maybe it'll yep. help you, and then I'm gonna turn it into a question. So one person said that you might enjoy a book by Tetlock called Super Forecasting. I don't know if you'd read it or not, but- I've heard of it, I have not read that book. So thank you, I'm gonna take a note of that. Thank you, go ahead. And I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you uh, the, the spelling of the name later, so you oh, can- take you. Okay. And then I'll, I'll turn it around, uh, and somebody was wanted to ask you if you had any articles or books or websites to maybe the, to do some additional reading on resiliency that uh, could help some of their underwriting teams. Oh, that's a good question. Um, if you will contact me, I will send you uh, a couple of links to a few decent articles on that. Uh, but okay. I I can't remember them off the top of my head. It is rather early and haven't had enough coffee yet. But if 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 you will just send me an email at that address there on the screen, I will uh, get back to you with a uh, with a list of some links. They exist. 
Very generous. And, uh, and I'll send you that link as well. Raid, uh, yeah, we're coming up on the hour. So I just want to really thank you. Great stuff today. Please, you know, refill that coffee cup or just go back to bed. Uh, you have our genuine gratitude. I know it's I know it's early there. Thank you so much. No, actually, it's, it's not, the sun's actually starting to come up. So it's uh, it's, it's daytime now. So it's all, all good. Right. Thank you. Very much. <laughs> well, have a happy Friday there. Uh, for Raid Newsland and the Veris Emerging Issues team, thank you for sharing part of your day with us. We hope it's proven valuable for everyone. We have recorded this webinar, so and we intend to post it on our site for future reference. And please share it with others. Uh, Raid, you can share it with your friends down in in uh, Australia that are probably still sleeping. And yes. finally, just thanks to everyone. Thanks to the audience. Um, Keep an eye out for more of these webinars. The EI team actually has a few other webinars in the works that we're putting together, and we hope to announce them probably towards the end of this year. Until then, just be well and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.